a lady who was a devout Protestant and always resisted attempts by the king to convert to Catholicism. She became second in the line of succession to the crown of England, but she was no power-hungry royal, and marriage to a foreign prince would seal her future fortunes. So was Mary a powerful, firm and effective ruler, or a lady who enjoyed a simpler life away from the politics of the day? Find out now as we look at the life of Mary Stuart. Mary was born on the 30th of April 1662 at St James's Palace in London. She was the eldest daughter of the Duke of York and his first wife, Anne Hyde. Charles II was Mary's uncle. Her grandfather, Edward Hyde, was the first Earl of Clarendon and he served under Charles as his chief advisor. She was entered into the Anglican faith and named after Mary, Queen of Scots, one of her ancestors. Mary was one of eight children, yet only herself and her sister Anne lived beyond their infant years. Because Charles II had no legitimate children, Mary found herself second in line to the throne throughout her life. Although their father converted to Catholicism, it would be a further eight years before Mary converted herself, with their Anglican background remaining in place under the command of Charles II. Over time, Mary and Anne were moved to spend time with Lady Frances Villiers at Richmond Palace. Mary had private tutors, her education restricted, but she managed to study music, dance, art and French. In 1671, her mother passed away, and by 1673 her father had remarried, this time to Mary of Medina. She was also a Catholic, but only four years older than Mary. At an early age, Mary began writing letters to a girl older than herself called Mary Apsley. She was the daughter of Sir Alan Apsley. In writing, Mary always signed the notes with Mary Chlorine, or Frances was known as Aurelia. By the age of 15, Frances began to feel uncomfortable about the letters and possibly considered them a little too suggestive for the time, so correspondence reverted to a more formal level. When Mary was 15, she became betrothed to the Protestant Stadtholder of Holland, William III of Orange. William was fourth in line to the crown as he was the son of the late King's sister, Mary, Princess Royal, but he was still behind James, Mary herself and Anne. Charles II initially opposed the marriage as his wish was to see Mary with the heir to the French throne, the Dauphin Louis. This would undoubtedly strengthen relations between the two countries and possibly provide a Catholic successor. In Britain. However, after disapproval from Parliament, he grudgingly agreed to the union. Her father, the Duke of York, gave his blessing upon pressures raised by the King and Lord Danby, and James would break the news to Mary about the wedding with William, her cousin. On the 4th of November 1677, Mary married William in St James's Palace. Mary was tearful throughout, yet Bishop Henry Compton helped settle her down. The next phase for Mary was quite possibly one of the most daunting. The bedding ceremony was a way to establish the consummation of the marriage, an observation attended by the royal family, and the final act of the king pulling two of the curtains around the bed. Later that month, William and Mary headed out to the Netherlands. Initially, they were delayed due to bad weather, but still, on the 14th of December, they made it safely to The Hague in what turned out to be a grand procession. Mary had an excellent nature. She was friendly, which endeared her to the people. Her marriage was also popular throughout Britain. William spent weeks, if not months, away from home at times, yet Mary showed great devotion and often thought about his well-being. Some months later, there was an announcement that Mary was pregnant. Unfortunately, this resulted in a miscarriage. It was just the start of unhappiness for Mary, but the one thing she wanted a child would elude her. James Scott, who was the Duke of Monmouth, stayed with Mary and William around 1648. However, Monmouth was not on friendly terms with Mary's father and seen by many as a rival. Monmouth's need was to become a potential Protestant heir. However, William was not about to consider this option and believed that Monmouth had no support in his quest. In February 1685, Charles II died. The leading cause of concern was that he left no legitimate heir to take his place. It made Mary's father the Duke of York King, as James II in England and Ireland, and James VII in Scotland. When the news got to Mary, she was whiling away the hours playing cards with her husband, but now she knew she had become heir presumptive. When the Duke of Monmouth planned a raid on England, William sent word to James about Monmouth's departure. 
He had sent word for the English regiments who were currently based in the Netherlands to return to Britain. As for Monmouth, it became catastrophic. He was defeated, captured and eventually executed. But more would come of this as James' subsequent actions proved to be quite strange. James had devised a somewhat controversial policy. His thoughts were to grant freedom of religion under a royal decree to all non-Anglicans. But his drastic idea had no support. Mary even considered it to be illegal. Although Mary sent a letter to James via the Archbishop of Canterbury, this was something that James seemed to have his heart set on. Further worries occurred when James refused to help Louis XIV, the King of France, after invading Orange and persecuting the Huguenot refugees. James now had heard enough from his daughter and unbelievably sent out a message to damage Mary's marriage. He said that William was having an affair with Elizabeth Villiers, the daughter of her child governess, Frances. With this information, Mary, one evening, waited outside the room of Villiers. When she saw her husband coming out at a late hour, she confronted him. William denied the rumours and the insult of adultery. Mary believed him and forgave him. Her infatuation with William was powerful and she had always hoped nothing would come between them. As early as 1686, Mary's husband had contact from disgruntled Protestant politicians. This was due to James forcing Anglican clergy members to read a new proclamation, granting freedom to Catholics and other dissenters within their churches. It proved useless and its popularity decreased further. More concern was raised when James's wife, Mary of Medina, gave birth to a child, a son, James Francis Edward in June 1688. Yet unlike Mary and Anne, he would be raised as a Catholic. Some asked questions about the legitimacy of the birth. Some claimed he had been smuggled into the Queen's room as a substitute for an actual stillborn baby. The delivery remained a controversial topic for some time, and suspicions grew. A group known as the Immortal Seven sent word to William, who was in the Netherlands alongside Mary, to lead an army to England to depose James. William was reluctant and quite possibly thought about his own wife's succession to the throne. But Mary convinced William she was no threat and that she didn't care about power. William agreed to the request and began plans to invade. Although grievances were surrounding the English people, he wanted the country to have a free and lawful parliament. Mary stayed behind and William and his army landed on the shores on the 5th of November 1688. The battle for power was short. Many of the English army and navy transferred over to William's aid. King James tried to escape but was caught. However, a second attempt to flee on the 23rd of December was successful. James travelled to France where he would spend the remainder of his life in exile. The overall circumstances of James left Mary upset. She was torn between him and her husband. However, she was convinced her husband had done the right thing in this matter. Mary came to England in the new year and William told her she must appear cheerful on her arrival in London. Sarah Churchill and others were in no mood for such joy and openly criticised Mary for her disloyalty. A convention parliament was convened by William on the 13th of February 1689. The session was to discuss the abdication of James from the throne, and now it was a vacant position. Parliament in their wisdom offered the crown, not to James's son, but to William and Mary, who would become joint sovereigns. Parliament decided that William would become king and remain in the position, even if his wife died. Another critical finding was declared stating that Parliament would place exclusions upon James and his heirs from the throne, and in fact all other Catholics. England was now a Protestant kingdom. On the 11th of April 1689, the coronation of William and Mary took place at Westminster Abbey. It would be Henry Compton, the Bishop of London, who carried out the ceremony. With state occasions, the Archbishop of Canterbury was the person to do this. However, William Sancroft refused after the removal of James II. The same day in Scotland, the Convention of Estates declared that they had removed James from power and that both William and Mary would also become King and Queen of Scotland. They undertook the Scottish Oath in London on the 11th of May. Although James was gone, he still had support in the Highlands. Viscount Dundee raised an army, but he suffered a fatal wounding. Leaders quickly disbanded his army and the resistance stopped in its tracks. There would be no more bloodshed. 
The Bill of Rights was one of the most important constitutional documents ever passed by Parliament in December 1689. It confirmed and established restrictions on the royal prerogative and declared items such as a sovereign would not be able to suspend laws that had been sanctioned by Parliament. It also confirmed the succession to the throne. As an example, if William or Mary would die, the other would continue to reign. Any children from the couple would automatically be part of any succession. Throughout the coming years, William was away from England, mainly on campaigns. He would war with Ireland against the Jacobites in 1690 and against France, who had camped in the Netherlands. Mary continued to control and administer the government in England, in which she had a nine-member council. It was quite a tough time for Mary. The Declaration and Bill of Rights would not allow her to partake in government matters. This was something she was happy to see, yet she still ruled and was no pushover, and she had her uncle arrested Henry Hyde, the second Earl of Clarendon, for plotting to restore James II. In January 1692, John Churchill, the first Earl of Marlborough, was dismissed on similar charges. Once again, these two occasions created a more significant void between herself and Anne, who was now strongly influenced by Sarah Churchill. In April 1692, Mary contracted a fever. She missed the Sunday church service for the first time in 12 years. When Mary recovered, she set about putting things straight with her sister Anne, who had unfortunately been suffering herself. Her recent child had died. Although saddened by the news, Mary kept her main objective in the following discussion to criticise Anne's relationship with Sarah. It would be a telling point in both their lives, as they never saw each other again. Mary stated in her journal that the split from her sister was a punishment from God. When the Archbishop of Canterbury died in 1694, Mary, who would normally dealt with all ecclesiastical matters, wanted to appoint the Bishop of Worcester, Edward Stillingfeet, However, husband William overruled her choice and the Bishop of Lincoln, Thomas Tennyson, took the role. Mary was a fit lady and she regularly walked between the palaces of Whitehall and Kensington. People said she would probably outlive her husband and sister, who both suffered from ill health. In 1694, Mary contracted smallpox. She was sent away to help stem the infection from spreading. Her sister Anne was again pregnant but sent Mary a letter saying she would run the risk to see her sister again. Mary declined the offer. Within a few days, the marks on Mary's skin had disappeared and she was said to be feeling well again. Her attendants thought it might have been measles that Mary had suffered. However, her condition again fell sharply. Smallpox had turned inward, a sign of a fatal form of the disease. On the 28th of December, at the age of just 32, Mary died at Kensington Palace. William was inconsolable at the news and he spoke saying he was now the most miserable creature on earth. Mary was widely mourned across Britain, her embalmed body lay in state at the banqueting house at Whitehall. She was buried on the 5th of March at Westminster Abbey. Her service was the first of a royal family member to be attended by all Parliament members. Mary had a crucial role in the Kingdom, and although she didn't realise at a young age the future of the British Crown, her marriage to a foreign prince split her loyalties between her new husband and her father. Yet she would always be loyal to William, accepting dual sovereignty but allowing William to have the final say. Constitutional changes would send repercussions throughout the land and Mary received them, knowing the previous regimes had poorly suffered under their own rule. But don't let her somewhat coy attitude fool you. Mary was also a strong character she could undoubtedly handle affairs if called on. Throughout her life, she had to deal with some big decisions. Although Mary didn't have the whole life many expected due to illness, she set a standard for future members of the royal family. And even though some say she was again just a pawn in the political minefield of the time, I'm not so sure. Unfortunately, Mary had two miscarriages and could not have any children again, which left a void in her life. Mary was loved not only by the people of Britain, but of those in the Netherlands. Further afield, people admired her as being an animated lady with a lovely disposition. Yet she agonised over her sister and never managed to mend their differences, and Anne was ready to step into her shoes. Mary's story is of a woman that carefully tiptoed through life, and 
all the while created a unique persona of appeal to the masses. Sadly, it all ended for Mary, but not for the House of Stuart. Thank you so much for watching, I really appreciate it. For more amazing stories, join me today on Benefit by Subscribing and check out both the videos coming up on the screen right now. And I'll see you all again here soon, here on the History Roadshow. Thank <laughs> you.